So Ed, uh, you have said that this film is um, uh, one of your top fives yeah. ever. Why? Um, I mean, you guys just saw it, so you can see that it is a brilliant bit of storytelling. Um, but uh, it's probably because of the uh, importance uh, that the film had for me at, a, at uh, an impressionable age. I was, um, I saw it for the first time when I was 19. I was an English major up at SUNY Albany, thinking I wanted to be a novelist. Um, but I was also, I just become a film studies minor. Never really gave any thought to making movies, let alone, I, I should say, never, uh, writing movies, let alone making movies. And then uh, this was one of those films that I saw back then, and I had no idea that uh, I had never seen a film like this before. Um, I immediately thought, oh, this is the kind of stories that I would love to write as a novelist, but that's really, this is the movie that made me decide okay, I think I want to be a screenwriter. And also, you know, I see it at 19. These kids are, you know, a year younger than me when I see it. Um, I grew up a working class kid up Island Valley Stream, right next to a very wealthy community. All right, for Valley Stream, all right. Um, and, you know, I just identify, even though it's, you know, obviously it takes place in the 50s, I identified with those kids in a way that I didn't identify with kids in Risky Business or Ferris Bueller's or Fast Times, uh, the films that were sort of being written for, let's say, my generation. So that's kind of uh, a couple of different reasons why I, um, uh, I fell in love with it. And then while I'm in film school, Peter Bogdanovich, the director, uh, did a special screening um, at the DGA that I was lucky enough to get a ticket to. And then to s hear Bogdanovich talk about uh, the film, getting to see it finally on a big screen, that's really when it, it really sunk in for me. Um, and you know, I mean, just I watched the last 20 minutes with you guys, and even though I've seen it, you know, probably 20 plus times, I'm always, you know, there are those small little touches that you forget about, whether it's uh, Cloris Leachman's hand shaking when she's trying to pour the coffee, or the soundtrack to the sitcom playing behind when the laugh track hits as she opens the door. Um, you know, and then also, I mean, the, the, it's such a sad and depressing movie, yet uh, McMurtry, the writer, I should say, that's another reason I fell in love with it. My mom was a movie buff, loved Paul Newman, turned me on to a great old movie called HUD, which you guys probably know, which Larry McMurtry also wrote. So then I went deep into McMurtry and that also was another reason why I became a screenwriter. Um, so anyhow, that's a handful of reasons that I'm rambling. But. I, I was extremely pleased I, w w w that you picked this particular film from a, a, you know, a list I gave you, because to me, and I follow your work since the very beginning, since the brothers McMullen, uh, it, it evokes some of the uh, um, ideals, idea of cinema, uh, some of the, int the poetic interest of, of your own work. Is that, is that true? I steal from this movie every chance I get, you know? I mean, absolutely. I mean, Brothers McMullen was definitely an attempt to tell the story of a realistic look at, and that's obviously, I went and tried to make that movie funnier than this one, but, you know, uh, a realistic look at working class kids and relationships. Um, I, I made a movie, my third movie, and I'd forgotten the scene that I stole. You guys, nobody saw the movie, it was called No Looking Back. But when uh, Tim Bottoms, uh, near the end, gets in the car and is determined to get out of town, and he's speeding out, uh, speeding out of town, and he just can't do it, and he's got to pull over, and he realizes, you know, that's not me, I hope, okay. Um, and then he's got to go back. Uh, you know, again, sort of growing up in Valley Stream, uh, the idea, and you know, I did not have a single parent of my entire friend group who went to college other than my dad who went back later in life. So the idea that there was anything other than sort of a working class life available to you and your hometown was something we really never dreamed of. Um, so, uh, so that's been a theme that I play with a lot in the movies and that's one and it is the idea of this, uh, Lauren Holly played the character, she wants to get out of town and I don't even remember how I ended it but I think the town calls her back in um, and there's another scene in this, which is really my favorite scene in the movie, um, where Sam the Lion uh, takes, takes them to the sort of fishing hole, and he tells that story about, you know, his, his true love. And um, so apparently Bogdanovich 
stole that idea from one of his favorite films by his favorite filmmaker, Orson Welles' uh, films, The Magnificent Ambersons, has a scene, and that I haven't seen since film school, so I can't remember the scene, but there's a scene where an old timer is telling a young kid about the sort of great love that got away. Um, so I have a, a film that comes out in August called Summertime, where I try to do my version of that, where I'm talking to my son and my nephew about a, uh, a similar uh, love that got away. And it's, it's a Long Island. That movie takes place all in the south shore of Long Island in the 80s about a bunch of kids who've just um, graduated high school and college. It's a, a sort of ensemble piece. It takes place over three weekends. Um, Memorial Day, first day of summer, they get their summer jobs, Fourth of July weekend. Uh, their situations are in full swing. And then um, Labor Day weekend, you know, at that age, the saddest day of the year, you've got to go back to college and, <laughs> and start being a real person again. So, um, as, as, a, as a director, uh, how, how would you describe, I mean, uh, Bogdanov just is, is, is a very specific style here, is wide shots. As a director, can you sort of explain a little bit to, to, to our audience uh, what's, what's the conception behind the design of, of the film, the coherence of it? Uh, yeah, so I mean, he was a big Orson Welles fan and uh, a big John Ford fan. And you can see a lot of those influences on it. Uh, you know, sort of the love of some of those uh, big sort of wide tableau shots. Uh, the camera isn't hyperactive. It's probably due to when the film was made, but also uh, sort of that style uh, allowing uh, scenes to play out slowly, uh, sort of um, uh, the depth of focus that he uses is a big thing in, in, that you see a lot in uh, Citizen Kane, which is basically, you know, you've got foreground action and background action and he's not cutting in between and uh, tries to let it play uh, within sort of one take. Um, you see that a lot um, uh, uh, in a film HUD, even though that's not Bogdanovich, but clearly the filmmakers at that time were certainly influenced by Wells. Um, you know, the other thing that, um, that really for me, uh, the, the casting in the film is so perfect. Even the smallest little parts like um, uh, Ellen Brennan, who plays the woman who works at the diner. Yeah, the cheeseburger. Uh, yeah. She's just fantastic, you know. Um, so uh, that attention to detail and casting, but then also the production design in this, you know, all of those rooms feel lived in and feel like, like that town, they are on their last legs. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, I think, as you said before, the use of television as this evil sound mm. that's creeping in into people's loneliness. Yeah. You know, uh, am, are we glad that cinema has proved a little bit more resilient? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Than, yeah. Uh, Although now, this. who knows? With Netflix and every other streaming service, people are sort of lamenting the death of cinema again. But hopefully, uh, Ho hopefully, it won't. Uh, what? Give, no, give I don't us, think give, so. us a little, give us a little time after we open, yeah. you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> before we do a tracking shot yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> on Main Street, you know, with the dry leaves. Uh, and, um, I'm going to open it to the public because I'm sure there are there are questions. And uh, would you, you want to raise your hand? Right there. Hi. Uh, for me, the pacing of this movie is dramatically different than anything that's made uh, today. Um, do you think movies today lose something um, because of the more frenetic style that sort of permeates? I, I, no, you know, I mean, I think it's a little bit, uh, movies today are made for today's audiences. That said, and I, I can't cite an example, but there are definitely filmmakers who are still willing to embrace this more, let's say, deliberate uh, pace to the storytelling. Um, I certainly miss this style of uh, storytelling. Um, you know, I know anytime you know you're in the editing room and you're getting notes from the studio, uh, that is the biggest note. Speed it up. Don't hold on that shot. Let's go. Overlap the dialogue. Can't they talk quicker? Um, uh, so I don't. You know, I mean, I miss it. I don't know. Um, you know, it's a good question. I think you. Yeah, you kind of, uh, I don't know. I really don't know. My kids can't sit through it either. But, you know, you guys are here and we love it. And, uh, you know, movies were speeding up when I'm a kid in film school and 
this was definitely very different from the movies that me and my buddies would go to on a Friday night. And I fell in love. And I think there's always going to be cinephiles out there who, who in, the, in the same way that certain music forms don't die. You know, like jazz is still alive. It's not what it was in the 50s, but it'll never die. Um, so hopefully this style of storytelling will never die. It just won't be as popular. As a filmmaker who's actually not only interested at, uh, in, in this style of, of storytelling, but also in the attention of characters and in the detail and you know, life in a small community, how difficult is for, for you working now to defend that, that realm uh, and that uh, vision? These kind of movies are impossible to get made. You just, you just can't get them made anymore. I mean, um, you see a little bit of this, I think, um, now on... Uh, premium television, you're getting to see different types of stories that, that uh, let's say, 25 years ago you would have seen at the same time. Like Showtime or HBO. Showtime or HBO. Um, so, um, you know, we, I mentioned this movie Summertime, we just finished another uh, film called Beneath the Blue Suburban Skies, which is a sad little drama um, that was impossible to get made. And uh, it has very limited box office uh, potential. Uh, and it's funny, like, I've always wanted to make a black and white movie because of this movie, because of HUD and, and some of the other great black and white movies I love. Um, and we were sort of lucky, so I was gonna say, as hard as it is, it can be done, because we were able to find the money for that. And even with those limited box office prospects, we thought, well, no one's gonna see this thing anyhow, so this is the one to shoot on black and white. Um, so, uh, so we even hurt our chances even more so. But maybe a year from now, we'll get uh, we'll get our fair shake at the Sag Harbor Theater. But so you, yes, but so you have two movies coming out. We have two. One has a, one is for August, and we're trying the black and white one. Uh, no surprise, we're still trying to sell that. So, another question. I feel like Hank Williams was a major character in, in this movie. And I wonder what you think of the use of that music as a director, and what, if anything, you know about Bogdanovich, his, his thinking about the music in the movie. Um, I had never been exposed to country music prior to seeing this film, other than maybe Dolly Parton in 9 to 5, if that's even a country song. That wasn't my thing at all. And, and I wouldn't say even when I watched it the first 10 times uh, that I wanted to seek out any of those tunes. Um, now, 25 years later, um, I own all those songs and built a playlist of my Last Picture Show soundtrack. Um, uh, and I love them, what, but for me as a filmmaker, uh, what I love that uh, he does in that, and you'll see like Scorsese does this a lot as well, there is no traditional score in the film. There's no incidental music to help us along with how we're supposed to feel. Uh, you know, a perfect example is, and I, I kind of had forgotten again, a scene I described where he's driving out of town and he stops. You know, you can imagine, uh, with a piece, with, with a score written under that, it would have really helped us along with how we're supposed to feel. Or, you know, rather than use music in the scene with um, Cloris Leachman where they're doing that sort of dance with their hands and negotiating what this next step is gonna be, uh, instead of music, he chooses to use uh, the television show or the radio show, whatever it is that she's listening to in the background. So Bogdanovich does this great thing where he uses um, what we would call source music, right? It's coming from a source that, that's in the characters' lives. A lot of times it's from the cars, uh, radios in, the, in the, uh, the jukebox or in their homes. And, uh, you know, that is sort of, uh, there's a way you treat a source cue to make it sound like it's playing from a, transit, from a, from a source. And then there's a, an effect that you pull off of it where it kind of turns it into score. Um, so this was, you know, early days for me in film school was a great sort of lesson in how to use music, how to use like what we call needle drops, like a song that's, that's pre-recorded, to help sort of um, uh, inform who the characters are, but also kind of uh, add to the emotion of the scene. And there's probably nobody better than it than... Uh, than Scorsese, I mean, you, you know, I'm sure you guys are all cinephiles and you know, but you see the way he does it, it's really, it's on another level, it's brilliant. Hi, how you doing? How you doing? 
Uh, thank you for being here. I, I, I've been a fan of yours for quite some time. I Thanks. thoroughly enjoyed your book, Independent Ed, right. major source, Went did quite a bit of highlighting in it. <laughs> um, you had touched upon earlier how you used Last Picture Show uh, to draw upon for your film, Summertime. Uh, with regard to screenwriting and so forth, is there is there a rule that you kind of stick to that's kind of, you know, whether it's grounded in truth or comparables, uh, film comparables, or from your own life, is there is there something that you really, uh, one rule that's kind of a foundation for drawing upon? Not really, because depending on the genre or the type of film uh, you want to make, uh, different rules uh, apply. You know, um, uh, I've made a couple of movies where uh, certainly Picture Show was kind of the tone that I was going for where, you know, there are no exaggerated characters. There is no exaggerated dialogue. You know, uh, if there is humor in it, it's it's conversational and it's, and it's born out of a real sort of uh, moment between two people, like um, the scene with Ellen Bernstein uh, and Tim Bottoms at the end where she kind of gives him the look like maybe she's going to invite him. You know, and I heard you guys all laughed at that. You know, that isn't a laugh necessarily on the page of your script, right? So, um, uh, so that's just grounded in a real moment. You know, uh, Brothers McMullen is a film that I, I wanted it to feel like real people, but also... I don't know if anybody, how well you remember the movie, but the youngest brother, Patrick, is like this very religious guy. I exaggerated him in order to make him funny. Uh, uh, so that was one where, you know, I was into, at that time when I was writing that, and this, uh, the movie that followed it, She's the One, I was really into Neil Simon at the time. So I was looking at, you know, reading a lot of Neil Simon plays, watching as many films as I can, to try and say, all right, how do you get away with um, writing a line that no person would ever say in real life without interrupting the flow of a scene that feels like two real people. Um, you know, so, that, so I guess that, that would be my advice or that's how I deal with it, you know. Uh, and a lot of, uh, I know, um, uh, writers, especially screenwriters, will look to other films as roadmaps or guidelines as to, you know, I, like even just reminders of what you can get away with. You know, I make um, you know, a lot of very low budgeted films. So a lot of times I will go look at, um, you know, let's say I would go look at uh, Annie Hall, let's say. And Annie Hall has a shot in it where um, uh, Woody and Tony Roberts are walking down a street in New York and he's got the camera 50 yards away from him and it's just the two of them walking, uh, you know, towards camera and it probably plays for a minute and a half. And it's very funny, and it worked. So when you're making a movie for no money, that's a way to knock off a page and a half of your script uh, with one shot. Um, now, a lot of times when you try it, you discover, hey, well, I'm not as funny as Woody. And that scene didn't work. Um, but those are things that I, I think it's OK for any writer to go look at uh, filmmakers they admire or uh, uh, the, the kind of film they want to make and sort of look at that for advice of, okay, I can try something like that. The other, but the most important advice I would give you for a writer is you have to write every day. I mean, that is just, that is, that is I, I did an adaptation of a, a film we couldn't get made with William Kennedy uh, of his novel Legs. Um, and at the time, I was a pretty disciplined writer. And he said, I, his advice to me, I asked him the same thing. He goes, I don't care what's going on in your life. Even if it's 15 minutes, you have to sit down and get something down. Um, and it's never for 15 minutes, because you know, it's like going for a jog. You know, if you put your sneakers on and you get outside, you're gonna at least go for a walk. You sit down, you open up your laptop, you start typing, you're gonna, you're gonna put in some time. Um, and the thing that I've started to do is, when I do hit that roadblock, or sometimes you're working on a script for a long time and you're just falling out of love with the characters and the scenario, have that other script that you also want to work on and dip into that for a week and then you'll come back to the, the, script, the main script you're working on and you'll see it isn't as crappy as you thought it was um, and you fall back in love. So that would be my advice. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry. Is my con? Okay. No, first I wanted to help answer some of the questions from before and that is um, can't you do both? Can't you have the serious interactive drama and all the crazy zaniness happening behind it, just to sell your, 
your film or your product, just to get your story made, just have the zaniness happening behind it. Because uh, I think it was Purple Violets that inspired me. And I Sub Speedway is my last picture show. So uh, I got that down, down between two covers. <laughs> Wait, I, le I, I didn't hear that last part. What was it? You made a film? Yeah, uh, no, I wrote a screenplay. Uh, oh, okay, all right, cool. I Sub Speedway and the two Congrats. six packs. It's my last picture show. Oh, nice. we, we need to know how to get a hold of your publicists. <laughs> <laughs> I will afterwards come and say hello and we'll, we'll sure, talk. Sure, I appreciate it. All right. Okay. It was, yeah, right here. I know I can Google this, but what if, whatever happened to Timothy's body? Uh, did anyone check it out? I mean, he still works. I don't think, you know, he had, look, having an acting career in Hollywood, and I can tell you, is so hard. You know, you get, you know, you look at the two leads in that movie, right? And they're both terrific. Uh, they, they both are great actors, good looking young guys. Uh, Jeff Bridges still makes $10 million a picture today. Tim Bottoms, whatever happened to Tim Bottoms? It's just, you know, a lot of it is luck. It's a lot of getting that right job at the right time where you then get either the big box office or the nomination and that then leads to better roles and better parts. Um, uh, I, in, in Tim Bottoms' case, I don't think it had anything to do with, obviously, not having the talent. I think it was just, you know, probably a couple of bad choices or movies that didn't work out. And instead of being number two on the list, you go to number 10 on the list, and then you're number 20 on the list, and then you're a guest star, and then you're on Hogan's Heroes, you know? <laughs> so, or whatever. That's what how, <laughs> how important is acting to you, especially in your own, uh, in your own films? What, uh, what's that? How important is acting to you in, in terms of what, everything you do, and, and especially acting in your own film? Yeah, uh, not, I'm not very passionate about my acting career. I, you know, I said I went to film school thinking I was going to be a novelist, then a screenwriter, then I decided I wanted to, I wrote a feature, and I was like, all right, I have to direct this. And just the idea that, um, uh, you know, I just, I just uh, probably because I'm a little bit of a control freak, I kind of wrote one of the parts for myself. And I'd, I should say, I acted in my student films, but I hadn't acted prior to going to film school. And I thought it would just be a thing where I'd give myself these little roles periodically, but I did end up falling in love with it. And then I got lucky enough, after a couple of films, Hollywood started to cast me in bigger movies. So. Uh, you know, as a young filmmaker, that was the greatest gift that I could ever uh, be given because, you know, I got to work with Steven Spielberg. I got to be on the set of Saving Private Ryan for, you know, three months, and I kind of joked that that was graduate film school for me. Um, and there are still things that I learned from working with Steven that, uh, that I apply on set today. Um, but acting, I, I, you know, I just never really pursued it and was never really as passionate about it as I was with my writing and directing career. And about five years ago, my kids are now teenagers, so about five years ago, I was like, you know what? I got rid of my agent and my manager, kind of quit acting other than being in my own things, just so I could stay home in New York with them. Um, so maybe when they go to college, I'll sort of re-explore acting for other people. But now I just kind of do it in my films, so. Hello. Oh, okay. I have a mic ready. Um, I'm over here. Yes, yes. I just wanted to say for me, and I guess for all of us, the sheer beauty of this movie was the unequivocal honesty of it. The characters, you, the feeling of the location, um, all of the things you were discussing, the impeccable selection of actors, the black and white, the excellent photography, the McMurthy script, all of those factors, including the length of the movie, combine to give us all such an honest portrayal of the people and the place and the stories. We needed that time. We needed the black and white. Um, why can't that be replicated today? Because it's very hard to do. All right, so the bullseye to make a film like this is so tiny um, because of all those factors you just said. Uh, you know, if, if you're going to make a comedy, a comedy doesn't have to be as perfect. You know, if you've got enough laughs in it, you went to the theater, 
to have a good time and have a couple of laughs, you can walk out feeling satisfied, even if the story doesn't hold together and the acting isn't great. You know, if you're going to see an action movie or a horror film, a lot of those same things apply. The bullseye is so much bigger for not only box office, box office uh, success, but also for kind of what the critics expect for that movie. You know, to, to make a film like this, so many of the elements have to be spot on. You know, uh, for example, if, if one bit, of, and you know, anyone who's made a movie will tell you, you know, you can cast someone in a lead or in a supporting part and the audition was great or they've been great in other things and for whatever reason, they just didn't work in your film. And when that happens, you, you know, you have a film that isn't a great film, it's a good movie. And if you're trying to make a movie like this where you're gonna ask a lot more of the audience, right? This is, an, this, this is not a uh, passive viewing. You know, you, you, Bogdanovich is asking you to lean in and focus on every subtle gesture that these actors are making. Um, uh, he doesn't make it easy for us. Um, so that's just, that's just quite honestly, is very, very hard to do. That's the beauty the of it though, thank yeah, you. Yeah, no it is, and it's also, you. you can imagine, if you're the guys cutting the checks and deciding what movies to put out there, you know, you get this script, you realize one element's off, and I just lost $20 million. You greenlight a comedy, you know, you, you have a, a lot more room to, uh, to fail. And I don't mean to knock comedies, I love comedies, but they're just there. And this was a successful, it was a, and this it was was a, successful. It was a very successful This won Best film. Picture in 71, so. Yeah, and, the, and, the, uh, uh, and both Ben Johnson and, and Cloris Lichtman won yeah. Best Supporting. Yeah, I think we have one. But year. even to the point of how tough it is, you know, Bogdanovich, great filmmaker, he made one other movie that got really good reviews, uh, Paper Moon, yeah. right? Yeah. And then after that, yeah. I think you What's know. Up Doc was also, was probably. Was that, was yeah, that him was, too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, not yeah. at this level. No, you not know, at this it, level. it wasn't like a P.T. Anderson who yeah. every time the film comes out, you're expecting greatness yeah. and he achieves it. Yeah, no, no, his career has been yeah. with lots of, lots of up and downs. Yeah, I think we have time for a couple of questions. There's one here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, Ed. I just uh, have a, well, I have a two-part question. Um, first of all, when you're writing dialogue, specifically in the perspective of a woman, I'm wondering, you know, how, how do you go about doing that? Do you have, like, your wife kind of, uh, you know, vet it and say, well, does this sound realistic? Would a woman actually say something like that? Yes. Yeah, that's, yeah. so basically, so that's what you do. I mean, I have my wife is the, the first line of defense. Uh -huh. And then will tell me, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> you know, no one would say this. But then also, uh, you know, if, and again, it, it comes, I think, with uh, time and experience, and with that comes confidence to then trust your actors. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, even before the actors are cast, you know, when we're doing the casting process and uh, an actress is going to come in to audition, before we even start, say, hey, if there's any line in here that you're just not buying, that just doesn't feel right, well, what would you think she would say there? All mm -hmm. right, and then we can just start there. Uh, and then once you're in rehearsals, you're constantly rewriting. And then once you're on set, um, you're constantly doing it. Um, so that, for me, I, that's the approach I've taken. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think I've gotten much better at sort of writing women compared to my earlier films for, 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 for listening, quite honestly. Right. So. Okay, and then when, when it comes to, when you first began, um, I mean, all of your movies have an incredible cast. And when you were starting out, I'm, I'm curious, how did you get, I mean, they were pretty well known. Uh, you, you know, you have Jennifer Aniston and um, Connie Brighton, you know, yeah. amazing stars um, in a low budget. <laughs> so, you know, Connie Britton in Brothers McMullen, that's the first thing she had ever been in. Oh. There's a good story with that. So Connie, so I'm making this movie for, we made that movie for $25,000. Wow. I put an ad in Backstage oh, wow. Magazine, and the ad said, you know, uh, non-SAG actors wanted uh, no pay, <laughs> uh, but we'll feed you. <laughs> and the great thing about making movies in New York is I, we probably got 2,000 headshots. Mm -hmm. um, wow. So went through and held all these auditions, and Connie uh, was one of the last women to come in to audition for that part. And, you know, kind of interesting to your, uh, the first part of your question, um, everybody was awful. 
And I thought, oh my God, I don't know, are they terrible or maybe the character is terrible? Connie came in and all of a sudden it was great. And I was like, okay, so the, the, the script is okay, mm -hmm. but she's really terrific. Mm -hmm. And so um, I offer her the part. She at the time uh, is friends with Ed Norton. Uh, and and they both have never been cast in anything. They're New York kids, waiting tables, going on auditions, doing small off-Broadway plays. She goes to Ed and says, oh, God, I just, you know, I got cast in this movie. There's no money. Uh, he's shooting at his mother's house out on Long Island. Um, he's never done anything before. I don't know if I should do it. And Ed says to her, uh, you're crazy. This is why we're doing this. Who cares if it's any good? You got to have the experience, you know? Mm -hmm. Maybe you'll have one good scene to put on your reel. But like, this is, we're actors, so you got to act, all right? It beats waiting tables. So Connie does the movie. Brothers McMullen turns into what it turns into. Connie is Connie Britton. Ed Norton, a year later, is still the uh, actor, um, you know, uh, working in a restaurant and just going on auditions. Connie has an audition for a movie called Primal Fear. She doesn't get the part, but she reads the script and the part of the young guy in it, she calls uh, Edward and says, hey, did you have, you, have your agents brought you in on Primal Fear? He says, no, I never even heard of it. She goes, get your hands on that script. You've got to go in and audition for that movie. He goes in and he gets the part and I think he got nominated. So Connie and Edward, uh, because they, I think they went to college together, but anyhow, that's sort of the connection of you know hmm. young actors in New York in the early 90s. Oh, very interesting, so, thank and you. And helping one another out. Yeah, you know? thanks. So. Uh, last one, and uh, no, we're going this way. It's, it's interesting that you got a laugh when you said that you shot Brothers for 25,000, but I think it's important to emphasize that uh, a film which I think is one of your best and is more recent, um, Nice Guy Johnny, also you shot for $25,000. Yeah. I mean, that's barely a lunch on The Irishman for one day. Um, <laughs> and, and, but, but I just want to stress that, that what you've been doing um, is an inspiration to young independent filmmakers, but also old independent filmmakers Thank you. such as myself. Um, instead of waiting forever for funding uh, and then getting a maybe and then finding out how you have to cast it in order for it to be viable, you've refused to wait. You've worked with a skeleton crew you get actors who really want to work with you. And as you put it, um, you allow yourself to go out of love with all the comforts and conveniences. You don't have a, a, a lighting truck. You don't have a makeup person. You don't have costume. You don't have continuity. You don't have set dressing. <laughs> but Let's you read the book. Let's <laughs> But you get your films made, and you make them in a way that you enjoy it enough that you can make the next film with the same kind of enthusiasm. So I wanted to ask you to tell an anecdote. You had a, um, an opportunity placed in your path as a director, and your relationship to that opportunity became the inspiration for Nice Guy Johnny. Could you, could you talk about that? Could you tell that story? Yeah, so I, this is coming after the film you mentioned, Purple Violets, was, uh, which was a nice little movie, and we actually shot a little bit of it out here. Um, but uh, at that point in 06, uh, a couple of the sort of indie distribution companies had started to fold. I think Warner Independent had closed down. There were a handful of others I can't remember now. Uh, and we couldn't, uh, we couldn't get a, uh, a satisfactory deal uh, to release that movie. So we tried something different. We're the first film that ever streamed exclusively on a service. We gave the movie to iTunes when they had just launched their movie site. So that's the first film that ever did that. And it actually made a decent amount of money. Um, but after that, uh, my agents and my producing partner, we were like, okay, this indie thing, maybe it isn't working. Maybe it's time to put yourself out for a director for hire. Just take a gig. And, uh, and make some real money as a filmmaker. Uh, so that's what I did. Um, and my agent sent me a bunch of scripts. Uh, and there was one that I kind of liked. I didn't love it, but you know, after about a year-long search, I kindly, finally said, okay, maybe this is the one I should do. 
tell my agent. She was very excited. She's like, okay, great. You can definitely get this job. Uh, I said, just give me the weekend to think about it. And I went out for a drink with my longtime producing partner, this guy, Aaron Lubin, who uh, we've been working together this year for 21 years. And um, we were like, oh, you know, we're, we've been doing this now at this time. It's maybe 16 years. And I'm like, we've always stuck to our guns and been like indie filmmakers. We've never went and did the schlocky job for money as a filmmaker. As an actor, I've done plenty of those. <laughs> Um, but as a filmmaker, we're, we were not, we're not going to do that. And we were sitting there we're like, look, the, my most successful film to date was my first movie that we made for $25,000 um, with a three-man crew, a three-person crew. So I said, why don't we just list sort of our, our rules for the next film? Like, if we can do that once, maybe we can do it again. So we wrote down, you know, $25,000, uh, three-person crew, only can shoot in locations we get for free. Uh, actors have to be sort of uh, willing to work for nothing and do their own hair, their own makeup, and wear their own clothes. Um, and that was sort of this this sort of guideline that we made for ourselves. Then it was like, all right, and then we got to come up with a script that we can actually shoot. Oh, I'm shoot it in 12 days. That was the other thing. So over the course of this weekend, instead of focusing on the job I'm supposed to say yes to, we start outlining a script that we can shoot in 12 days for, for $25,000. And on Monday morning, I call my agent and I said, I'm sorry, I can't do the movie. Uh, I got something else I'm going to do. Uh, that movie did get made. I won't, I'll never say what it is, but it was terrible. And thank friggin' God I didn't do it. Um, uh, Dodge the bullet on that one. Uh, but um, so that movie was, ended up being Nice Guy Johnny. And we shot that movie in 12 days for $25,000. Uh, and what we did with that was because of the Purple Violets experience and we saw how much money you could just make on iTunes alone and that had no theatrical, no DVD, we were like, all right, if we make a movie for 25000 and we do half of what we did on iTunes, we're going to just turn a tidy little profit and let's go make another one. So then we did the same thing the following year with a movie called Newlyweds and that actually turned into a nice big financial uh, hit for us, not by Hollywood standards, but by, you know, indie micro budget standards. Um, and that's kind of, that was the thing. And, and you talked about the list of compromises, right? So we did a list of compromises of like, all right, so if we make a movie like this, here's what we know we won't have, you know, uh, we won't have any movie stars, we won't have any distribution, we won't have any perks, we won't have any cranes, we won't have any steady cams, we won't have any craft services, we won't have any good meals. Uh, but here are the things we will have. We'll have final cut. We'll make the movie we want to make. We'll get to choose the actors. We'll get to uh, make all the decisions as to music, et cetera, et cetera. So anytime uh, Aaron and I sit down to decide what we're going to do next, we sort of pull out our list of compromises and decide which one do we want to work off of on this one. That's kind of how you do it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, guys, for, thank for you me. for listening. Appreciate it. And we promise we'll have him back with his own films. <laughs>